Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tony Coppola, and I am the Public Information Officer with the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office. Today is a day that many had hoped for, wished for, and prayed for. We have major developments in the Kristen Smart investigation. Let's begin the news conference now by introducing the President of Cal Poly, Jeff Armstrong, Robin Babb, Cal Poly Police Chief George Hughes, Under Sheriff Jim Vogue, and San Luis Obispo County Sheriff Ian Parkinson. Chair. Good afternoon. The one uh, person that was not introduced up standing up front is Detective Clint Cole, who is our unsolved cold case detective, and I wanted to introduce him myself. I also have several members my staff that are <clears throat> excuse me out in the audience so um, my name is Sheriff Ian Parkinson I'm joined here obviously by the president of Cal Poly uh, Jeff Armstrong I want to begin today or we're beginning here today uh, because this is where it all began on the campus of Cal Poly University on May 25th 1996 this was the last place that Kristen Smart was seen alive uh, it has been 24 almost 25 years uh, since uh, Kristen went missing, 24 years without a resolution uh, until today. I'm here this afternoon to announce the arrest of Paul Flores for the murder of Kristen Smart and the arrest of his father, Ruben Flores, as an accessory to the murder. I want to start just with a little timeline for those who, uh, who may not uh, follow this completely. So how did we get here? It's been a long process. Uh, Kristen Smart was a 19-year-old freshman Cal Poly student in May of 1996. She was last seen on May 25th of 1996 at approximately 2 a.m. near the intersection of Perimeter and Grand Avenue, which is right over my left shoulder, uh, as she walked home from an off-campus party. Kristen was last seen with Paul Flores, uh, also a 19-year-old fres freshman that walked her home from the party. Uh, Kristen never returned to her dorm room that night and has not been seen or heard from since that time. She was reported missing to the Cal Poly Police Department on May 28, 1996. Cal Poly Police handled the initial investigation into her disappearance with the assistance of investigators from the San Luis Obispo County District Attorney's Office. On June 26, 1996, about a month later, the San Luis Sheriff's Office assumed the lead investigation in the case. We have actively investigated the case since that time. We have uh, received assistance from the FBI, California Department of Justice, uh, numerous other law enforcement agencies throughout the state of California, and actually out of the state of California. Um, I introduced Detective Cole for a reason about four years ago, uh, the Board of Supervisors and I think the chair of the board, Lynn Compton is here, uh, granted a request that I had for a unsolved cold case detective. Many of our cold cases are actually assigned to our detectives in addition to their normal caseload and Kristen's was one of those cases. Kristen's was one of the cases that I uh, uh, targeted for this position and after granting that position Detective Cole uh, assumed that position and, and has been working on Kristen's case since then. Throughout our investigation Paul Flores has remained a person of significant interest. There's been some discussion of what is a person of interest versus a suspect and it's really a matter of terminology. Uh, when a crime occurs everybody in, involved in that area could be a person of interest until they're ruled no longer of interest, either through alibi, through witness, through physical evidence. But Paul remained as a person of interest and as the case progressed, became uh, a suspect and the prime suspect in the case. So I became sheriff in 2011 and did a complete and requested a complete review of all the physical evidence that had ever been taken in the, uh, in the missing person case. Um, in late 2016 we discovered additional evidence that confirmed that Paul was the suspect in the disappearance. In 2019 
We interviewed several witnesses that had not been previously interviewed. Uh, and I'll, I'll say uh, some of that information came, came to light through the podcast that many of you are familiar with um, that was uh, produced and, and uh, eventually uh, led to our, our uh, interviewing that witness. And uh, with, the, with the knowledge of the dis uh, discovered uh, of new evidence, new witnesses, sheriff's uh, detectives secured a court order authorizing the interception and monitoring of Paul Flores' cell phone and text messages. This is one of many things that have been done over the last 10 years. In February of 2020, detectives served search warrants at the home of Paul Flores, as well as his sister, mother, and father, all simultaneously um, last year. Physical evidence recovered during these searches led to the service of additional search warrant at Paul Flores' residence in April of last year. During the search warrant, detectives recovered evidence related to the, the murder of Kristen Smart. In March of this year, detectives served another search warrant in Arroyo Grande uh, at the home of Ruben Flores, the father of Paul Flores. Additional evidence related to the Smart invest investigation was discovered that, at that time. So as a result of this evidence, a San Luis Obispo Superior Court judge signed two arrest warrants and two additional search warrants. At approximately 0730 this morning, uh, today, uh, both were arrested simultaneously with a team down in San Pedro, California, and a team in Roy Grande, California, and they arrested uh, Paul Flores and his father, Ruben. Paul was arrested for uh, charge of murder uh, with zero bail, meaning he is unable to bail, and Ruben Flores was arrested as an accessory to murder with a bail of $250,000. We are still currently in the process of executing those search warrants. Um, could be there for the remainder of the day or even into tomorrow, depending on, on what they find. Now, I understand a lot of people want to know what we found in the detail, and that's kind of the, the question that people continuously ask us and ask me, is what exactly did you find and what exactly do they have that has led to this? Well, um, I can tell you, unfortunately, the search warrants were sealed, which means I cannot discuss what evidence was found. And probably more importantly is, is that we have a due process right right now. And everybody here is, is, um, is, is allowed that due process right. That means it has to go to court. There has to be a trial of, 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 of 12 people and decide his guilt or innocence. So discussing specific items of evidence is, is just not appropriate um, at this point. Um, I will say this, and this is probably a, a, a question that I will answer at this point, um, that we have not recovered Kristen. Uh, we will continue to focus on finding her remains regardless of any court action. So we will continue the process of finding out where Kristen is. Um, we know that's an important part uh, uh, or important uh, issue with the family. Uh, when I took office, uh, one of the, the uh, first acts that I mentioned was re-examining starting from the beginning. And I often tell people this, that law enforcement solves crimes really two ways, through witnesses and physical evidence. When we lack witnesses, we rely on physical evidence. You hear it in the news all the time about physical evidence that has linked somebody to a crime. Well, that's extremely important to solving a crime. In this case, we were dealing with a case that was, at my, at my point of coming into office, about 14 years old, which makes it very difficult. Since that time, I believe there's a list somewhere, I can't see it, probably somewhere over here. Thank you. Um, that is highlighting what I'm just about to tell you. Since I came into office in 2011, we have served over 41 search warrants on this case. Uh, re, re, uh, done physical searches of 16 different locations, one of which was back on the back hill, you may remember a few years ago, a complete re-examination of every physical item seized, um, submission of 37 items of evidence um, from the early uh, days of the case for modern DNA testing, recovery of 193 items of physical evidence, new physical evidence, We've conducted approximately 137 person-to-person -person interviews, 
and in addition completed over uh, 500 additional police reports. I can tell you this file, the size of it is probably in the size if you put it on a, 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 a hard drive, it's in excess of three terabytes. It's that much involved in this case. Um, it's my hope that we're able to take the first step toward justice for the Smart family. Uh, peace for the community, some justice out there uh, for all of us, and most especially for Kristen. Um, I have spoken to the Smart family uh, numerous times, including, uh, including this morning, um, matter of fact, twice today. Um, I think they're feeling um, a bit of relief, uh, but as you can imagine, um, until we return Kristen to them, um, this is not over, and we have committed to them that we are not going to stop until Kristen has been recovered, no matter what the cost, no matter what the time, we're committed to that. And I know they believe in us. I know they believe that we will, uh, we will find Kristen. So this afternoon, we have turned the case over to the San Luis Obispo District Attorney's Office. The way the process works, the warrants that were signed by the Superior Court allowed for the arrest and booking of Paul and his father, Reuben. Uh, now the case has been handed to the district attorney uh, for review and their announcement of, of further proceedings. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my investigators. There was certainly the uh, investigator that I introduced, Detective Cole, but there was a detective commander that's in the audience, a, a new detective commander, um, many people over the years that have worked on this case. I think the, the, the people that are representing here today, myself, the chief of Cal Poly Police, uh, weren't part of this investigation, weren't part of this agency that we are all in um, when this happened. And I think the cooperation that's taken place uh, I know President Armstrong has really opened the door for us to do and provide us anything that he possibly can, uh, including having this press conference here in Cal Poly um, today. So I'd like to introduce uh, President Armstrong uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Sheriff Parkinson. I appreciate so many members of the Cal Poly and Central Coast community, San Luis Obispo being here today. Our Cal Poly and Central Coast communities have watched the case of Kristen Smart's disappearance closely and hoped for justice for Kristen and resolution for the family for years. The news today of arrest in connection with, this, with the case brings sadness, but also a measure of relief and hope for resolution. While we know that today's developments uh, do not represent the end of the case, it is a significant uh, step. We at Cal Poly offer our thanks to Sheriff Ian Parkinson and his department, as well as District Attorney Dan Dow and his office, who have worked hard to find answers in this case for Kristen and her family. I know that many across California and the U.S. and many of you here today also thank Chris Lambert for his efforts as well. Last, our thoughts and prayers continue to be with Denise and Stan Smart, all of Kristen's family and friends as this process proceeds. Thank you. Thank you, President Armstrong. Um, I am uh, prepared to answer any questions that you might have. Um, just understand, as I stated, that some of the items that I, I just will not be able to discuss. He was driven from San Pedro and booked into San Luis County Jail uh, today already, so he's here. Sheriff Parkinson, is, are you guys any closer to finding Kristen at this point? And the search warrants that are being served currently, reason to believe that she may be at Ruben Flores' home or any of the properties belonging to the Flores family? Well, the first part of the, the, the question is, are we any closer? And the answer is yes, I believe we are. Um, but only time will tell. So if, if obviously we recover, we'd be making that announcement today. In regards to the search warrants, you know, we're, we're after all kinds of things, physical evidence again, 
anything, uh, anything that might lead us to the location of Kristen. Um, and as you know from the previous search and, and as you reported from this search, we're out there with you know, our ground penetrating radar again. So yes, it's, it's safe to say we're, we're checking everywhere possible. I, uh, I believe that, that uh, Paul's arraignment will be on Thursday. Um, it really depends on Ruben. Ruben has the ability to bail out. If he bails out, then he will not be uh, there on Thursday. But if he is still in custody, he will, uh, too, be in court on Thursday. Thursday at the latest, then? Is that yes. Up? Yes. Yes, sir. Well, as, as I've, I've said before, um, and, and this case is probably the, the best illustration of it, is that it's, what, it's not what you believe, it's what you can prove. So when, when people ask, why is this taking so long? Because the general public knows this much about the case, and the case is this big. And so as it progresses, you know, and when I talk about that do due process rights, we have a right or we have a duty and obligation to protect people that are innocent as well as guilty. So we can't base arrest on what we might believe. It has to be based on physical evidence. Mr. Sheriff, uh, you mentioned you can't talk a lot about some of the evidence, but can you talk in general about the physical evidence and was any of the physical evidence that it belonged to Kristen Smart, you believe, and was any of that physical evidence found in one of the floors? Let me see if I can answer it this way. Um, forensic physical evidence was located, and yes, we believe it's, it's linked to Kristen, um, and yes, we did find physical evidence at, uh, at at least two homes. In regards to what, what Chris Lambert discovered? Yeah, you know, that, that, that comes up every year. So since I've come into office, we have two anniversary dates that are, are really centered around uh, Kristen, and that is her birth date, and that is the date she went missing. Um, that's typically when, when interviews, you know, people want to interview me or interview the department on, on Kristen's case. I've always said that those are really good things um, because it's getting that message out. I think what uh, Chris did with his podcast was, he took a local story that was generally locally, and he expanded it to a national story, an international, actually, I'll say, because once that message got out, um, we started getting more information. Now, some of it is information that we already had and knew, but the value to it was is that there's, as, as we see here, there's a lot of people that, that are students here that don't, aren't from San Luis Obispo, and so when they graduate, a lot of them will leave back to their home area or on to pursue, you know, other jobs. And so they're, they're kind of dispersed all over the country. So as that message gets out to the nation, you know, um, those people that used to live here during that time might remember something. And so that's always the value of that. And I think what, what Chris did with the podcast was truly put it out nationally to bring in new information. So we did, it did produce some information that I, I believe was valuable. Um, first to the missteps, yes. You know, I, I, I think, you know, there were certainly some missteps. Um, were there some things that were done really, really well? Yes, too. Um, you know, you can be an investigator and look at a case that was investigated 10 years ago, look at that case and say, well, I wish they would have done this, or I would have done this. So you can always look back and see things that could have been different. But it, there, there really is no hiding the fact that, that there were some mistakes made early on, and, and, and it made it much more difficult. You know, that first 48 hours is pretty critical in a missing person or a homicide. Um, and, and there was mistakes made that made, made that, that much harder. And I think that's why when I talk about it's what you can prove, it's not what you believe, I think there's a lot of people that, you know, that listen to Chris's podcast and kind of, you know, either relived it because they were around during that time or learned of the story and then what 
they tended to focus on was, hey, why, is, why aren't we moving forward? And trying to, to, to really impress upon people that, you know, our duty has to be to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not just we believe this person did it and we're going to pull them off the street and deprive them of their, their you know, their freedom. Yes, as, as Denise Smart has said, um, it's a puzzle. And the puzzle is, we're assembling the puzzle. And imagine if you've ever built a puzzle, you've found uh, missing pieces, how frustrating that is because you're looking for the one piece and you find out there's three pieces that somebody's taken out of the puzzle or not putting it back. Well, this is what it has been. It's been a puzzle and it's a very slow uh, process to find each of those little pieces because at the end of the day we got to see what that puzzle reveals and so that was something Denise said early on to me and I absolutely agree with it that's that's the slow process of this and, and finding a little bit each place so when you ask was there something of value my answer would be yes there was something of value um, in various locations that kept, kept coming up and coming to light I, I really think that's a, a question that the DA is going to have to answer. I mean, once we turn the case over to them, they, they're the ones that actually file the charges. We know that the you know 187 of the Penal Code murder is is applicable. Whether or not something else will be, I think that's to be determined by the DA. I mean, and without finding Kristen, without remains or a body, how confident are you that evidence, physical evidence alone, will hold up in court? Well, you know what? You never know. I mean, you can have you can have you know eyewitnesses, and it doesn't hold up in court um, because of either the admissibility or believability of the witnesses. So we don't know that until we try it. Um, I'm confident that we have enough of a case to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the second part of your question is without Kristen. Well, there's cases all over the nation what they call nobody homicides. As a matter of fact, there's a case in point. Uh, that was on 48 Hours up in, in uh, Placer County um, where they prosecuted, were successful. Um, it went through appeal, they won, and years later they actually recovered the victim, the female victim's body in that case. So it's done all the time. It, well, I say it's done regularly is probably a better answer. So yes, I, I, I believe it, it can be done and I think that the district attorney can be successful because I think there's enough evidence to, to support it. My last question is, this is such a high profile case. I mean, you can see the crowd that this has garnered just for this press conference. Do you think that this is going to be a fair trial in San Luis Obispo County or will it have to be tried elsewhere? So it's a good question and, and I, I don't have an answer. Is there a chance that it's going to push for a change of venue? Yeah, absolutely. But that again is going to be a, a court function um, to determine. That's a, 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 an item that will be placed in front of a, a judge to make that determination. It's a belief that he participated. No. Yeah. Can't comment on that. I, I I I can't I can't discuss that other than to say that every you know every location. I, I think I mentioned that we searched 18 locations, um, and and most of those involved digs. The most significant one being on the the hillside behind us. Um, but but we're going to continue until we find her. Uh, that, that's something that is presented in court. I, I, I can't present a motive or a theory. We, we, that's what court is for. Jeff, what about the mom? What about Susan? That was answered just a little bit ago. You might have missed it. Jeff, so for the two men arrested, are they on suicide watch? If not, why? If not, why? Well, I can tell you this, anybody that comes in on a high profile crime, there's probably, I'd say a dozen people right now in custody for murder. Um, they're all on watch but because of the, the level of their charges. And it's not just murder. It could be, you know, uh, any serious crime or high profile crime. That's always an issue and that's always watched for that specific reason. Reaction 
the the only thing that's been relayed to me is that there there was virtually zero communication, no response. Well, as you know, I, I, I'll assume you know that a Ramey warrant is a warrant that allows for a law enforcement officer to go into a home and take somebody. If it was purely a, a, an arrest that a peace officer has the authority to make, they could make that in a public place on the street. But if you're going to into a house, you cannot make that without an arrest warrant. So in order to, to, to make sure that he was in custody, um, it was imperative that we went to Superior Court and a judge sign uh, a, an arrest warrant, in this case a Ramey warrant, to allow us if we needed to go inside a home to take somebody that we could do that legally. Sorry, let me think. Yeah. Those two, uh, first two pictures of Paul were taken in San Pedro. And the third one was taken in Rio Grande. No. N nothing of consequence. I mean, what was their demeanor? Were they surprised? You know, I heard reports of Paul being in Rio Grande over the Well, at least it was at the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm. I'm. I had a specific question I'm sorry. About their demeanor when they were arrested, we heard that you know Paul was here in Arroyo Grande or San Luis Obispo County over the weekend. What was the reason for waiting? Oh, why not arrest them when he was in Arroyo Grande? We we we're well aware that he was in Arroyo Grande. Uh, we had a, a warrant to be executed in San Pedro at his residence. So. Yes, it, it could have happened here and we could have gone down there. But, um, you know, when you set a timeline, when you talk about an operation of that size, when I'm sending, you know, 30 people or 20 people down to Southern California and 20 people here along with forensic people, it's, it, it, it's a lot bigger operation than, than meets the eye. So uh, either when you start planning that and figuring out what personnel you have, once you get to a timeline, it's just better to follow the timeline unless something really changes, and, and really that didn't change much. Okay, um, anything further, I'm going to refer you to uh, my PO, uh, uh, Tony Coppola, and uh, thank you for coming today. That was San Luis Obispo County Sheriff Ian Parkinson speaking for the last 30 minutes on two arrests made today in the long unsolved case of Kristen Smart, the Cal Poly freshman who disappeared from campus on May 25th, 1996. The sheriff saying at the beginning of his press conference, 24 years without a resolution until today. Paul Flores long considered a person of significant interest throughout this investigation before becoming the prime suspect arrested this morning. On a charge of murder is what is to be expected from the district attorney right now on suspicion of murder. He has been booked into jail in San Luis Obispo County, along with his father, Ruben Flores, booked as an accessory. He is in jail on $250,000 bail right now. They are both expected to be in court on Thursday. They are still executing search warrants right now. Those search warrants are sealed. And the sheriff would not discuss the evidence that has been gathered. He said it's not appropriate given that there will be a trial. The one thing that he did say was that Kristen Smart's body has not yet been recovered. Paul Flores, again, the last person to see Kristen Smart alive. They were both 19 year old freshmen at Cal Poly. He walked Kristen Smart home from a party at 2 a.m. and he was the last person to see her. 41 search warrants have been served. In this case, over the last 24 years, you heard 18 locations have been searched and 137 interviews all leading up to today and two arrests made. Paul Flores for murder and Ruben Flores, his father, accessory for murder. We will have live team coverage tonight on News Channel 12 at 5 and 6 o'clock. 
with highlights on the news conference as well as reaction from neighbors in Arroyo Grande and a full timeline of events leading up to today. If you missed part of this news conference or want to watch again, we'll get it posted in its entirety on our mobile app and website at nc12hometeam.com. We'll see you again at 5 o'clock.